Welcome to the Business Radio Network. Enjoy Small Biz, Big Voices with Stephanie Rising. Hi, I'm Stephanie Rising, a business coach and author in beautiful Tucson, Arizona. Today, it's my pleasure to speak with Clint Perry, Business Development Manager for Focus HR. Our interview will conclude with a Proust Lightning Round, and our final segment will be Dear Coach, when I'll coach listeners through issues they've emailed in. For the time being, we are recording our show remotely, so thank you for bearing with any sound idiosyncrasies. It's my pleasure to welcome my guest, Clint Perry. Clint has a passion for business growth and personal development. At Focus HR, he helps small business owners accelerate their growth with HR outsourcing. Clint began his career at Xerox Corporation, helping to grow Xerox's document outsourcing practice in Tucson by over $4 million in revenue. Thereafter, he launched his own coaching firm, Action Coach, where he coached over 300 business owners in Southern Arizona. Most recently, Clint led strategy and client development for Lappin International, a strategy and leadership consulting firm focused on building purpose-driven companies and leaders. Clint is a past columnist for Inside Tucson Business and the Arizona Daily Star, and he is one of Tucson's 40 under 40. He earned a degree in business management from BYU, an MBA from the University of Arizona, and is a SHRM Senior Certified Professional. Clint, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Welcome to the show, and I'm just really eager to ask a whole bunch of questions about what's going down these days. Thank you. I'm so excited to join you on the show today. Thanks for the invitation. Well, I appreciate it. And I, I wanted to kick things off with a, a statistic that I came across that uh, was very surprising to me. I know that Arizona has a lot of small businesses, and Tucson in particular. But I saw in a 2018 SBA survey that 99.4% of Arizona companies were classified as small businesses employing a total of a million people. And I, I know that obviously COVID has had a, an impact on many businesses of all sizes, but thankfully we still have a lot of small businesses that are alive and well. And I think what's always been a challenge for us as small business owners is finding the time and the resources to effectively juggle all of our obligations. With HR specifically, what's the challenge that you see small business owners most frequently run into and what can they do to alleviate that burden? Well, it's a great question, Stephanie. I think most often what I notice in the small business world, at least as it pertains to HR, is they, most business owners just simply lack a good HR strategy and a good HR infrastructure. Yeah. And many may go, what is that exactly? Well, you know, they simply, essentially, in its simplest forms, a good HR strategy is, you know, how do we best manage the employer-employee relationship? What are the strategies we employ to do that, to ensure that we can attract and retain the best talent? And then do we have a good infrastructure, a good, you know, a good systems, a foundation, technology systems to support that HR strategy? That's great. I'm taking notes. So, I take notes with, all, I learned so much from every guest and, and something that you just mentioned, you know, the systems and the technology. I think a lot of business owners are very sensitive about wanting to be competitive and attracting good employees and retaining them, but then they forget kind of the, just sort of the, the unsexy back office aspect of that, which is the, the protocols and the technology that help people to orient and acclimate uh, so they feel like they're successful. Right. And so ultimately, it's you know, when you bring somebody in uh, to your company, uh, first impressions matter um, and how you onboard them and what is that, what is that system or what does that approach look like? What does that process look like? Um, and it really, another, another way to look at it is what you think about the employee life cycle uh, from the time that an employee is recruited into the business, uh, they join the business, and then they go through onboarding, getting them sort of acclimated to your, your business and the culture and the way you do things. 
uh, to ultimately how you develop and train them and how you engage them and retain them long term. Um, ultimately, how you recognize and advance them through uh, the business and, um, and then through ultimately separation, whether they, they retire or they separate and move on to a different career. But through that entire life cycle, you have to have strategies, a strategy around that. And how do we, uh, in all of the, each of those steps of the, that cycle, and also in infrastructure, uh, systems and technology and good people to support that. Uh, or things are going to be fairly fragmented and it's going to be reactive versus sort of proactive. And it's, it's not, it's not going to run well and it's not going to ultimately create the kind of environment, uh, the kind of business that employees are going to enjoy and thrive in and want to work for because things are going to seem sort of hodgepodge and, and disorganized and reactive. Um, and it's going to ultimately, the other real big issue is exposing your business to risk. Uh, yeah. If you don't have good systems, uh, if you don't have uh, around compliance and really understand the labor laws and how they apply to your business uh, and are doing things right as it comes, at least as it pertains to HR, you really are opening yourself up to some risk that's not, not good. And I, I think the irony of that also, and you know, you and I have discussed this. We are also small business owners. Um, we help other small business owners. We're all control freaks. <laughs> it is really what? difficult. I know it's shocking news. It's so difficult to start a, a company and it's such an extension of, of who you are, the brand that you've created. And I think all of us struggle with, with letting go. And so then our default is, the DIY in all aspects of our business, including HR. But like what you were saying, the irony with that is keeping it all to ourselves and trying to, to control it ourselves probably indirectly opens ourselves up to risk because most of us are not HR experts. So what, what are the indicators that it's time to look at a different solution like HR outsourcing, and what are the, the real benefits or the implications to a business owner for choosing to outsource their HR? So business owners, and you know this very well as a coach, Stephanie, that ultimately they have a lot of plates they're spinning. Yeah. And trying to keep all of those spinning, and they, if you're, again, control freaks, like we were talking about, you tend to add more without, uh, you know, ending one or two of those plates spinning. Um, it just can be too overwhelming and ultimately get them in trouble. And so, you know, I heard a, I heard a great, uh, great advice from a former CEO I used to work for. And he said, do what you do best all of the time and do what you don't do best none of the time. <laughs> and I think that's so, such great wisdom. And when yeah. you think about, okay, what am I really good at? What am I passionate about? What should I be doing all the time? Well, you know, when it comes down to business, yeah, small business and big business, really, you as an owner, executive, your real keys are how do I attract and keep the best talent? Because ultimately that's going to differentiate my business. And how do I attract and keep the best customers? Anything sort of outside of that, um, you know, or should you really be spending your time, your precious time that you only have so much of in a day doing things like HR? Uh, or other things, technology or accounting or whatever other things that you may be taking onto your plate that you simply uh, just can't, don't have the time or the, the knowledge or the expertise to be doing. So if you look at sort of the, that trick, you know, that trigger point or indicators, I, I think most, something happens when a business sort of gets over that 10 employee mark. You know, mm, yeah. usually they, it's somewhat manageable and they, they can handle sort of the quote HR issues, but I've had so many conversations, discussions, and it seems like more often than not business owners have noted when they sort of trip over that 10 employee mark, start growing, things get a lot more unwieldy. Um, so you really, as a business owner, have to take a serious step back and look at your time. Where are you spending it and how much is HR transactional administrative HR things are soaking it up or how much of it is soaking up a ton of a, an office manager or bookkeeper. I mean, they could be doing budgeting, forecasting, planning, analysis, things that ultimately are going to help you make better business decisions 
and, and contribute a lot more to the bottom line. So um, those are absolute sort of things to really be thinking about as you think about what's, you know, versus the sort of do-it-yourself mentality, I can just handle these things on my own. Yeah, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to business owners who, you know, they're working with a finite amount of resources, and they think if they do certain things themselves that they're, they're going to somehow save themselves money. But to the point that, that you just made, what they don't always take into consideration are opportunity costs where if they weren't doing, if they stopped doing something that really fell outside of their purview, and you know if it falls outside of your skill set, it's taking you longer, right? So you're spending more time doing something that you're not as good at, whereas if you devoted that same amount of time to growing your business and engaging in revenue generating activities, you probably wind up more than paying for outsourcing. Exactly it, Stefan, exactly. Because ultimately they say, well, how much is, you know, what's this going to, you know, cost me this kind of thing? I, it's going to cost me a lot. And I said, you know, I always say to them, exactly, what is it going to cost you? What is it going to cost you in terms of lost revenue, in terms of, of growth to your business, in terms of potential customers that might exit or cost in terms of losing out on potentially good talent? The cost, the real cost, if the big cost, if you look at those big things, far outweigh any, I'd say, minuscule amount of money you're going to save doing these kinds of things yourself. And that, I, one of the reasons um, I'm so happy to have you on the show is because I think HR has this like really unfortunate reputation of being a necessary evil instead of a real asset to a business. And it, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is the fact that diversity and inclusion in the workplace adds so much to a, a company in terms of productivity, profitability, customer loyalty, um, the quality of decisions that are made. But somebody has got to manage all of that talent. And with diversity and with an inclusive workplace come a lot of different points of view, um, the, the need for people to feel accepted by their peers, the need for people to feel like they have a voice in decisions. Um, that, that's more of an art than a science. And somebody's got to have their hands on the reins. So how how would you view an HR director's role in promoting and managing the kind of culture that brings a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of profit to a business? So it's a great question. In fact, I, I really, a lot of my past sort of 10 years before my time at Focus HR or was spent in leadership and strategy and doing a lot of work actually in uh, executive development around. We had a, a much of our practice was actually focused on cross-cultural intelligence, diversity, inclusion, kinds of related types of work. And, and then mainly in the, in the larger, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 kinds of businesses. But certainly it's as critical or as important for small businesses as it is for large companies today. Um, and I, well, I think one of the things I noticed that's interesting when it comes to diversity and inclusion and its role in business is that it really starts with the business owner, starts with the CEO, starts with management and executive team. They simply can't leave it to the HR director. They, so they, certainly, they certainly can't abdicate it. Um, right. And they can certainly delegate certain key things. But you know, an HR director is pivotal in the role, and they're pivotal in terms of being you know, certainly a great cheerleader, a coach, an advocate, a promoter. Uh, but when it comes to those core DNI uh, values, they have to it kind of starts from the top and they've got to be sort of decided on and integrated and committed to, to the fabric of the business, the fabric of the culture and actively lived and embodied each day. And it can't just be saying, oh, well, our HR director is going to take care of that. Uh, no, it really starts from leadership. And then, uh, Ultimately, a great HR director is going to be key and instrumental 
in amplifying that in the business and not only uh, through to the people side of the business and, and talent and of course uh, when it comes to promoting that those kind of values and philosophy to those who they are recruiting um, bringing into the business but then and certainly to the existing employees uh, ensuring that those values are promulgated and and promoted importantly so um, and it can't just be, here's the other thing I noticed about sort of like diversity inclusion or other kinds of things, employee engagement, whatever you name it is, and you, you give it, but ultimately we noticed many times in business it would become more of a internal, say, a marketing promotion or campaign. And, some, and it almost landed as something very superficial. Um, but you know what, people, employees, customers, suppliers, they pick up on this stuff. They, they'll see through that sort of something that's not really uh, authentic hmm. to the culture of the business and to the values of the business. So I think that's another important role that HR directors uh, plays in working with leader, the leadership of the business is ensuring that this is something we, that really matters to us that we care about that's sincere and genuine and not just a, oh, me too kind of afterthought that we're just saying, oh, yeah, we believe in diversity and inclusion, but you really don't live it. You really don't buy into what that means, and you don't actively integrate it into uh, day-to-day -day business. So the HR director is kind of that, the living, breathing embodiment of something that's put into practice. Like, it, this, is, this is more about action. This is less about just language. Correct. Okay. Now, for small businesses who have fewer than 10 employees, you know, maybe they just have a handful of people working for them. You know, HR does tend to fall under the purview of the lead accountant. And a lot of them actually do a great job keeping their employers in compliance. And yet at the same time, HR covers a lot of very nuanced territory. So what's something that you wish every organization better understood or implemented when it comes to their HR? You know, that it is a huge challenge actually, Stephanie, especially because we do have a lot of uh, micro businesses that, you know, out there that under the sort of 10 employee mark. Yeah. And, um, and, it, and when you say nuance, you're right. Uh, there are you know, HR, human resources, and the broad practice of the discipline of HR, especially when it comes to labor laws, it's just changing. It's changing rapidly every year. I mean, case in point, look what we've just gone through in the last few months. Yeah. I mean, the institution of, of new, new regulations laws uh, and all associated with their you know, PPP loans. I mean, it has been a incredibly difficult, challenging uh, thing to try to navigate. And that's left small business owners like, scratching their heads and trying to figure it out. A little alone challenging some for us uh, as it's, you know, have really experts in the field and trying to help our clients really navigate it. But I think, as I think about these small business owners, you know, what's something that they really better understood? For me, I just wish they really understood that it can be an actual business strategy um, and perhaps even the most important strategy, not just sort of an afterthought. It's not a trans, HR shouldn't be something that's transactional or just administrative. Uh, and certainly worry about it being advocated or delegated to you know, some accountant or bookkeeping kind of role. Talent mm -hmm. is the key differentiator in business, right? Anybody can, yeah. anybody can imitate or, or replicate uh, technology or products or services, but leadership caliber, talent caliber, you can't you know, replicate. That is your key differentiator in business. It should be the, the business owner, CEO's number one priority, getting and keeping good talent. Um, so even, you know, in a startup mode, that should be something that's important in, in thinking through the future of the business. A uh, key part of their strategy is, okay, how are we going to handle human resources? What is our strategy going to be? What kind of infrastructure are we going to be building here um, so that we can handle and we can scale and grow and we can do this right and it not be sort of this thing that evolves into something that's sort of fragmented and reactive and ultimately exposes us to a lot of risk. Mm. And that, that is a really, that's a really good point. Um, 
and I wrote down that it is a key differentiator. And, and as you were mentioning that, it, it made me think back to earlier in our conversation about when we're in DIY mode and we're, we're keeping everything to ourselves, kind of the equal and opposite reaction that business owners will have is they just won't pay attention to anything at all, or they, they shunt it off onto somebody's plate and they're just so relieved that somebody else is quote unquote dealing with it and they don't have to anymore. They don't really take the time to plan, to transition, to communicate. And HR is, is just far too critical to, uh, for lack of a more delicate phrase, to half-ass it. Um, it's probably where you have your greatest amount of risk, and it's also probably where you can derive, as you said, the majority of your reward. Um, you know, I know that there's kind of that, the old traditional percentages, you have to spend like 20% of your time on marketing every week, 20, at least 20% always engaging with your customers or um, networking or something that's going to expand your your reach your relationships how much time do you think every week these smaller business owners that are forced out of necessity to take a more diy approach how much time should they be spending every week focusing on developing and implementing their hr strategy well ultimately if talent is the key differentiator in business if you agree to that premise and that sort of statement um, then, you know, to me, it's, it's a significant majority. That's, you know, perhaps, you know, 50, 60% of your time should be really focused at least on are we, what are we doing to attract and retain and develop the best people in our business? And ultimately, if we're going to grow, um, what, I, you go ask any business owner out there. I mean, I, I have conversations all the time. It is in the number one issue. It is the number one pain, you know, headache. They, I just can't find and keep good people. Yeah. And it's tough out there. And even in the, the current situation we find ourselves in, I mean, we've had record low unemployment and Tucson has struggled to um, have an inventory, a sufficient kind of inventory for good talent, especially those in a more of a you know, managerial or executive kinds of um, very highly skilled types of talent, um, it's very difficult. And it, it keeps us uh, almost, almost, I think a lot of business owners go, it's almost like a full-time job just to try to find and keep good people for the yeah. business. So it has to be a significant portion of your business. And maybe sounds crazy, but honestly, it, it is the key, to me, it's the key differentiator. We're going to take just a quick break on that note. This is Small Biz Big Voices hosted by Stephanie Rising. I'm a small business coach on a mission to get business owners off their hamster wheel and empower them as authentic and influential leaders. My online dynamic marketing course provides step-by-step -step videos and exercises to help you connect with your ideal client and discover your true sales personality. Find out if you're a panther, politician, protector, or professor by going to therisingeffect.com. Today, I'm visiting with Clint Perry of Focus HR. Now, you, you mentioned the, the impact of, of COVID a little bit earlier, and I think you know, regardless of whether we've had to pivot our business to a virtual platform or whether we're still at least partially functioning in person, all businesses of all types are still at the end of the day composed of people. And those people are looking for opportunity and a sense of purpose. And they also come with their own complexity and a need to be heard. So for those who are brave enough <laughs> to become HR, directors, what advice would you give someone thinking about a career in, in HR? What can they expect, particularly in today's marketplace? Well, you know, number one, they better be get ready for a wild roller coaster ride because they can expect <laughs> a lot of change and fast. And, yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's amazing to me uh, just being in the field and again, where we do this 24 seven, uh, what it takes for us as a 
you know, full-time you know, staff of several HR managers and those that are in the field and benefits and payroll and workers' compensation just to keep up with what is um, going on uh, in the market and keep up with the current pace, the regulatory burden, the regulatory changes and different uh, labor laws and other sorts of things that are happening. So uh, they, they've got to be prepared and interested and motivated and <laughs> excited about change because that's the name of the game here in HR. Um, I think also there's a very big push in the HR industry for, um, you know, HR and traditionally has had a bad rap in such of being known as sort of handling a lot of the administrative tactical types of things, just being paper pushers and doing a lot of those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and there is a big push from certainly from SHRM, uh, the, you know, the association um, that represents uh, HR practitioners and others to um, elevate the role of HR to a more strategic role. So I think somebody that's interested in looking at HR, a career in HR, they've got to say, you know, am I somebody that's strategic or am I more you know, sort of tactical, administrative? Um, wh what do I enjoy? Uh, what am I passionate about? And what am I capable of doing? What are my back, my skills and interests in that area? Hmm. Um, and looking at SHRM, you know, or an HR CI designation uh, is, is another professional designation I think is important. Uh, certainly doing an internship, uh, just getting some, you know, real, real life experiences is something I really want to do. I can see myself doing for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But then if the good ones and they're hard to find, the great HR practitioners, if you can you know, find one, they're worth their weight in gold. They're, they're exceptional, but they're just very, very difficult to find, especially that we've noticed in some of the smaller markets. It, and it is, you know, like we were saying before, I think anytime your job revolves around people rather than just straight administrative tasks, it is more art than science. And, and yet HR, it's almost, it's almost like you have to have a little bit of a split personality that you're dealing mm -hmm. with things that um, are highly variable, sometimes volatile. And at the same time, you are responsible for upholding compliance and things that are very objective and regulatory. And so I can see from an HR director's point of view that that is a little bit of a high wire act. It is. It's not just birthday parties and, and office parties and <laughs> you know, feel good, uh, you know, uh, employee engagement programs. It's, it's a whole different ball game. Um, the, the, good HR uh, practitioner has a lot on the line. I mean, they are ultimately trying to mitigate risk for the business. They're trying to elevate its strategic positioning in the market to help it compete most effectively for, uh, you know, the war on talent, which is definitely a war out there. And how are they helping that business to win the, that war, attract and retain the best talent? Um, and ultimately, how, what are they doing to, you know, develop the good people they have? How are they, um, helping you know, create a, a great career path or in helping uh, promote and recognize and advance people uh, in the business because you, know, you add this whole, and then you add the whole <laughs> mix of millennials and Gen Zers that are coming into the market and bring a whole different challenge, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, to the talent game. And HR managers are tasked to figure that out kind of that out so and and in that role particularly i mean with i i've mentioned on on prior shows i mean with millennials now being the, the largest living workforce and you know, some of them are are now well into their 30s and they've got a lot more experience under their belt but there's right. kind of the younger end of the millennial spectrum and now gen zers starting to come into like the entry level workforce. Um, one of the ways in which I view human resource work, I think that people who gravitate toward it are often naturally really good mentors. And like the younger workforce can really benefit from true mentorship, not, not being, you know, patronized or dismissed or, you know, like patted on the head, but like 
true cultivation, true mentorship. And I know I've learned a lot over the years from HR experts such as yourself, who have given me a lot of insight into some very complex situations that have been fraught with possible mm -hmm. risk. Um, so it makes me curious, who has been an influence to you in, in your life or in your work um, where HR is concerned? What did you learn from them? Well, you know, certainly I, I've learned from some great, uh, in, at least in my role, I've learned from some great clients that have been in the HR business because at least in my previous role, um, most of our, my previous career, uh, most of our clients were chief HR officers of large corporations and, and or heads of talent management, uh, talent development. Um, and gosh, I've dealt with dozens and dozens of them over the, the 10 years I was at least in that uh, particular career. And I can think of, you know, just really a sort of, I don't know, a couple of handfuls maybe of those and maybe even a handful of those that were really the good ones that I thought were so, I, don't know, I think balanced maybe is the right word, but balanced in how they approached human resources uh, where they were just, they were strategic and they were thoughtful. They really had that sort of business brain. They really thought first, okay, what's really most important to the business and where, what are our business objectives and what is this going to be aligned? They always talk about HR alignment, right? HR alignment to the business. Um, is this aligned or not? What we're trying to do, is this going to make, a, is this going to move the needle on our performance or not? Um, it wasn't about sort of their own, um, program or their, um, their, their own personal uh, sort of goals or aspirations or what they wanted HR to be. It was really a much, they were really elevated above that and more looking at overall the business objectives and goals, and making sure they were aligned, their teams were aligned, anything, any HR initiative, object, uh, uh, program, whatever it is, policy, uh, was aligned to the business objective. So that to me was really, uh, really impressive. And I, there was a, again, probably a good handful of HR leaders that to me embodied that. They were also just really good to, to get along with, to, to talk with, to, they were, they were, uh, they weren't reactive. They weren't over dramatic. They were just uh, pragmatic. They were of course very personable, um, and just got along well with other leaders. They, they had a way to just ebb and flow. They could adjust their behavioral style, their, their communication style to a wide variety of different business leaders and line leaders, um, and functional leaders in the business that they had to work with and be able to listen, you know, being that capacity to listen, to understand, to test for understanding and then to align uh, to those mm -hmm. leaders and what their needs were and to deliver on what the, those needs were, that's a, a rare, rare quality. And I think that also distinguished those HR leaders that I've, I've dealt with in the past. And since you had a chance to, to witness that level of professionalism, I'm, I'm assuming those folks worked for larger companies, and I'm, I'm tying this back to the, the comment that you made earlier that there's, there's like this war for talent that everyone, whether it's a large company or small company, everyone is looking to get the, the best possible team assembled that they can. And so it's, it sounds like larger companies um, who have these very talented HR directors that not only recruit but retain top talent, how can small businesses compete with that? Well, it's tough, uh, especially in a, perhaps in a market like ours, where there's already seems like a low inventory of really top talent because we, we see it in many cases fleeting to, you know, Phoenix or other larger metropolitan areas where they feel like there's more opportunity and a lot more companies, um, mm -hmm. more career opportunities. But I, I think Honestly, the only way that small businesses can compete with the larger companies here who have, you know, more resources, um, many times it seems like better benefits or better brand 
name recognition, they've got to liberate themselves from anything that's low value, that's administrative, that's really pulling them away from this number one priority of finding and keeping good talent. Uh, they've got to employ every strategy to find and keep them. But then, you know, one of the strategies they could can look at, and I think is very effective, is like HR outsourcing because ultimately you you're gaining advantage, you're leveraging an HR outsourcing business that has the scale and size of a lot of small companies, hundreds of small companies aggregated together that acts like you know, uh, has the buy power and resources of large companies. So if you can aggregate your small business to a lot of other small companies, hundreds of other small companies, that's going to gain you some, some leverage, some buying power, and some uh, ability and infrastructure and a strategy at really sort of the fraction of cost of certainly doing yourself as allow you to compete in a much more effective way with the larger companies going after that talent. So if you can offload, liberate yourself of all to like an HR outsourcing firm, like, you know, like a focus HR, ultimately then I can then re take that time and focus on in my business. I can focus on getting and keeping the best talent because now I have access to some of those things that the big companies do that I didn't have before. So it really in a sense levels the playing field a lot. And I think that's, that's very significant. I also think another thing they can do to compete with the larger companies is really a step establishing a purpose-driven business, you know, especially the millennials, Gen Zers, they want to make a difference, right? They want to feel like they're part of something big. They want to, they're looking for this sense of meaning, a sense of contribution to be part of something. So what does your business stand for? What's your purpose? Why do you exist? What's the contribution you make to the world, to the, your customers that no one else does in quite the same way? And how do you infuse that into your uh, recruiting efforts and into your uh, retention efforts? I think that's significant as well. And, you know, you've, you've got, you're competing with the larger companies and you can, you can, ins, you can inspire a potential candidate to be part of something, a growth opportunity, something that's exciting and, and something that's meaningful is going to make a real positive difference in the world. That could be your edge. Kind of, this is the, the perfect segue to the last question I wanted to ask in this in this part of our conversation, um, when you were mentioning outsourcing to a company like yours that has this aggregate buying power, uh, Focus HR serves clients in 33 states. And so chances are someone listening to this podcast has access to your expertise. What does Focus HR offer to business owners who are looking to either streamline their compliance or really up their strategic HR game? What, when you say you have aggregate buying power, um, what, what does that mean to the end user? Well, first, first and foremost, certainly, what, and I kind of referred to this before, we give you an HR strategy and an infrastructure. It's already built, it's designed. It's sort of like a plug and play in a sense. You don't have to build it yourself, figure this out yourself. We've already <laughs> invested lots of money and time and hired the best people to figure all that out. You, you've made the wheel. We made the wheel. Don't reinvent it. Don't create no. it. Invent it yourself. Um, you've got a team of experts here. You've got the tech, you know, technology, the platform. You've got best practices. And so all that tied up really in a variable cost kind of pay structure where you don't have to invest all the fixed costs and other variable costs to you know, develop something like that or keep something going like that. Um, I think also, you know, ultimately, if they're really look, looking to HR, up their HR game, they need to spend, again, more time focused on the activity, the time of finding and seeking good people for the business and yeah. keeping those people and less time on managing them and um, handling all the administrative things that go along with them, that go along with that. The other sort of aspect around sort of the leverage or the aggregation is you know, just an example of workers' compensation or employee benefits when you're leveraging you know, hundreds of companies and you have um, thousands of worksite employees that are aggregate as part of those hundreds of companies that are clients, you are leveraging that you know, from a buying perspective. So ultimately that's going to translate into lower costs and certainly a better situation, better scenario, better health plans or a better workers' compensation policy uh, for, your, for your business. 
a, a much better outcome with far less investment of the owner's time, which sounds like a win-win to me. Yeah, less time, a better team, and ultimately better technology. You can learn more about Clint and Focus HR by visiting their website at www.focushr.net. We will also have that for you in today's show notes. Um, we are going to go on to the Proust lightning round. Are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> Let me have it. All right. The Proust questionnaire was a parlor game made popular by the French essayist and novelist Marcel Proust. He believed that by answering 35 specific questions, an individual reveals their true nature. I'm going to ask you five of them. And the first mm. is, which historical figure do you most identify with? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I, I'm a person of faith. And so as I think about going back to historical figures, we'll go to a biblical figure. So how about... Like, I love Joseph of Egypt. Uh, guys just went through so much. And I, even through all the adversity and uh, the challenges, he rose to be somebody great that actually made a huge impact in uh, saving Egypt from famine. And um, I just, I'm always impressed with, uh, with that story. Very cool. What is your most treasured possession? Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I think my faith, honestly, uh, I, and I know it's not a sort of a physical, tangible possession, but it's something that is very dear to me and something that is uh, an anchor for me in my life and uh, that I, I treasure greatly. And it, uh, it's what brings me joy and peace and, and happiness. What is the quality you most like in a person? I, you know, for me, it's kind of a couple of things. I think empathy is one where somebody can really empathize. They can listen and show they care. And the other thing I really like is spontaneous and um, something that's fun. What is your greatest extravagance? <laughs> Probably Reese's. <laughs> <Never comes. laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm a little bit of a Reese's fan, but uh, you know, if I can get out, play a game of golf, which I, you know, I love and rarely do. Um, I always find an excuse. I'm too busy and et cetera. Um, that's probably my greatest extravagance, sadly enough. <laughs> <laughs> extravagance in <and> frustration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and lastly, what is your idea of perfect happiness? Whoa, perfect happiness. Hmm. You know, to me, it goes back, I think, just to, to balance. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got so much that's going on in our life, but if you can find balance in the areas of your, you know, those sort of like the, the cubby areas, physical, spiritual, emotional, social, um, intellectual, mental, those capacities, if you can have balance in each of those areas, I think life is pretty good. And, <laughs> you know, I've got, and, and, and I've also got, you know, four kids, so seeing them being productive and uh, just, you know, the people that you love and care about, that are happy and healthy, uh, all that in a balanced sort of life, to me, that's sort of perfect happiness. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I love getting honest, spontaneous answers to these. You <laughs> have great answers. Thank you, Glenn. Next, we're going to have Dear Coach. Um, I would love to have you chime in. This is the end of our last, or the, um, at the end of our last segment. Hmm. Dear Coach gives our listeners the chance to have their emailed questions addressed. And Many of the problems that I see in businesses, if not relationships in general, stem from either a misunderstanding of others or a focus on our challenges rather than our strengths. So I'm doing a four-part Dear Coach series on the DISC behavioral types to help us better recognize our own motivations as well as that of others. And today I'm featuring the I, who is the influencer. With a need to pepper most tasks with fun, their path toward a goal may not always be a straight line, but it will definitely be an experience. Influencers are the world's optimists. They are guided largely by their emotions and the belief that almost anything is possible. They just need to find a way. They also thrive when accepted, 
A smile paired with thank you or good job will win you great loyalty from someone who's genuinely eager to be appreciated. That need for social acceptance is both a driving force and an Achilles heel of the I style. Their need to connect and communicate, their charming persuasiveness, and their natural ability to befriend others make them highly productive in people-oriented industries. However, eyes need to be aware that their eagerness to please and their emotionalism can sometimes fog their objectivity and cause them to attach themselves to ideas or people before all the facts are in. Each of the DISC styles has a specific emotional motivator that tends to guide their decision making. Sensitive as they are, it's fortunate for eyes that they are motivated by optimism. They rebound quickly in their confidence that tomorrow is indeed another day. Similarly to the D style, eyes like to keep things moving along without getting bogged down in too many details. However, where the D is driving for results, the I is seeking out fun and friendship. In work or play, eyes must enjoy what they do and who they interact with or they quickly become bored. Their near constant need for variety can be difficult to fill, as well as make them prone to flip from idea to idea. These are our sprinters, not our marathoners. It's that combination of few details, much hopefulness, and easy distraction that can cause others to view high eyes as Pollyannas. Eyes can lack the concrete facts that typically root solid decisions, trusting instead their own feelings. A talkative and emotional group, eyes sometimes get off task and share more information than others can comfortably hear. But eyes who master their gift of the gab and adapt to the listener's style are highly effective at connecting with and influencing others. Think of Oprah. There is a reason why she taped her show for 24 years in front of a live audience. Eyes feed on the energy in the room. For someone as dynamic and influential as Oprah, that sense of immediacy and connection is simply essential to her being. In business, gregarious influencers generate enthusiasm for ideas and excel at motivating their team. Their personableness makes them excellent for business development as they tend to be top revenue producers. What others may perceive as a lack of a solid plan is an influencer's ability to view life as an organic, ongoing process. If they attempt something and it doesn't work out, their optimism enables them to stand up, brush themselves off, and move on to the next idea. It isn't that they don't learn, it's that their energies are concentrated in their belief that they can always recover. While this can be viewed as flaky, an advantage to having an eye on your team is their ability to adapt. Eyes help guide their teams to go where the social current takes them, usually putting them at the forefront of trends and sales. When they curb their chattiness, the eyes' warmth and energy can shine through in wonderfully infectious ways. To sum up, eyes are a gregarious, charming, and energetic group whose relationships are a boon to any organization. Their genuine affection for people and sense of humor offer a boost of good energy to those around them. For excellent communication, sales, and a shot of fresh enthusiasm, you want an eye on your team. We have a few minutes left, and Clint, I, I wanted to ask, what advice can you offer those who have chatty but charming influencers in their lives? How do you pers personally approach, like, working with them and, and maybe corralling them a little bit. <laughs> that, that's the operative word, corralling, right? <laughs> um, good luck. <laughs> you know, I, I, love, uh, I love working with eyes uh, and that, that their optimism, as you call it, they're spontaneous, uh, fun, uh, very energetic, so energized by people, and just always have that sort of bright outlook on life um, and, and just very relationship-driven. Um, I think a, a couple things for me that are important. Um, number one is just helping them understand what what makes them who they are, are and why it's a strength. But you can also know, uh, as you very well educate them on their strength, their, your greatest strength can be your greatest weakness. Yes. And how do you uh, and amplify and enhance certainly the strength and mitigate 
in your weakness. Now, oh, they may not be able to do it themselves. So sometimes, well, first of all, just being aware, if they can be aware of the things, uh, the, the, what is it, the weaknesses or the, some of the traits that can hurt them, uh, whatever role they're in, say it's a sales role, what are the, some of the things that they, the, or the pitfalls uh, or areas they need to be aware of as an eye in the sales process that can trip them up? Sometimes that could be, well, you're so enthusiastic about this relationship that you get and love the conversation. Uh, you're talking so much that you're not quite listening like you should or you miss some important details that were key to that uh, solution or the problem the client wanted to solve, the, needs, uh, the prospect wanted to solve. Um, or, and or another potential area I've noticed with eyes and as example in a sales role um, is just attention to detail. Um, mm-hmm. And they're so excited about the prospect, but then they're moving on to the next project. But there sometimes it requires a lot of patience and perseverance. Um, you, you, know, you may, they may be working with somebody that's an, a, an S or a C on the disc profile that just requires a lot more time and a lot more data and information. And eyes can grow very impatient and they're ready to you know, move on where they could have they left some, some, an opportunity on the table because they just didn't exercise that pace. So it may be that either they need to ratchet it back and, and put in sort of systems or habit, develop habits or ways that they can sort of modulate that eye and, and be persistent and patient or work with somebody, have a partner that complements them that brings some of that S and C characteristics and behavioral styles into uh, the relationship and can help balance that I and help make up for uh, fill in the gaps where those uh, I tendencies tend to trip them up. That is great advice. And uh, I, I see exactly the, the same challenges for my high I clients. And I, I think your observation about being a little more patient, you know, and acknowledging that tapping the brakes and slowing down a little bit and not um, not like destroying your eagerness and your enthusiasm because that's that's part of what makes an eye tick, but you have to be able to regulate it in a way where you're um, you're just not blowing the hair back. <laughs> Right, I'm exactly. Sitting across from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is the uh, you know is that uh, that optimism, which is a great trait. How do you balance the realism side of this? Yeah. And and just being able to ask, have some tough questions to ask that really give us a realistic sense of you know an objective sense. Where are we? Uh, whether that's in a sales cycle or in some other kind of relationship or other um, you know in personnel kind of. Uh, thing you're working on, a personnel thing you're working on in the business or whatever operational thing, ultimately being able to ask them and or have them se- ask themselves the tough questions that can give them a more object, kind of slow them down a little bit and give them a more objective viewpoint, uh, a more realistic viewpoint, kind of temper them a little bit, I think is also healthy. That is great advice. Thank you, Clint. And we are going to end on that wise note. This brings us to the end of today's episode. If you have a question for our Dear Coach segment, or if you'd like to schedule a DISC meeting to discover what your behavioral style means to your business, please email me at stephanie at therisingeffect.com. I also invite you to follow the show on my website at therisingeffect.com, which includes show notes and all my Dear Coach tips. My thanks again to today's guest, Clint Perry with Focus HR to my producer, Mark Bishop, and to you for joining us on Small Biz, Big Voices. Stay safe and be well. 